So different human subgroups have different genotypes to some degree. Are they big differences or little differences? Well, in the case of the gene that codes for hypoxia-inducible factor two, uh, the differences are big. Like in the uh, in Tibet, maybe 60, 70, or 80 percent of the population uh, living there has uh, EPAS1 alleles that are associated with the favorable response hemoglobin response to altitude. So how about for the overall genome, though? Uh, what percentage of the genes are going to be different in the whole genome from that group from the lowlanders? Oh, boy. Very small, probably. So they're, they're essentially identical to the lowlanders, except for small changes. Yeah. I mean, natural selection, the beauty of natural, well, there are many beauties of natural selection, but <laughs> one of them is that uh, we have to remember that genes are inherited, that loci are inherited independent of each other. Mm -hmm. And so natural selection can act to increase the frequency, let's say, the EPAS1 allele, and have, if the stress is high altitude hypoxia, high altitude hypoxia would have no effect on uh, you know, alleles that might be associated with resistance to malaria because there aren't mosquitoes there and there's no mm -hmm. malaria. Right, right. Uh, maybe if you moved up to higher altitudes, there are fewer mosquitoes, less malaria, and so that would relax the selection to provide protection. But I think the bigger point we're trying to make here is how we should think about human subpopulations and their genetic differences. And I think what you're saying is, while there can be specific spots where there are big differences, overall, people are just about the same. Yeah, I think that would be reasonably accurate, yeah. yeah, yeah. Of course, this can be a contentious idea because sometimes people talk about different races as if they're completely different lines that have yeah. evolved separately. And I think most anthropologists and others are recognizing that that's just a mistake in thinking. Yeah, because uh, most of our, a, a lot, most of the genetic variation that we see uh, in modern human populations is the result of local adaptation. For example, like to high altitude or uh, to uh, falciparum malaria, or it's the result of my recent migration mm -hmm. into, uh, let's say, high latitudes in, at, uh, where there's not very much sunshine and it's hard to make vitamin D. So what happens if you migrate to high latitudes? Well, in that case, you may not be getting at a, uh, making enough vitamin D because we make uh, vitamin D in our skin. And in order, as a result of uh, the uh, action of photons from ultraviolet light, mm -hmm. and w presumably the populations that moved there uh, most recently were populations that had dark skin. And we know this from mm -hmm. looking at the DNA of skeletons of people who lived uh, a thousand years or so ago in, uh, in Europe, and they had dark skin, dark hair, dark eyes. And nowadays, the further north you are, the more frequent you see fair skin, uh, fair hair, uh, and light eyes. So presumably because those with darker skin were more likely to get rickets and other diseases of vitamin D deficiency. Yes. But let's go back before that. Um, I keep talking to my students, asking them what color the skin of other primates is, and most of them think it's black. Uh, yeah, it's and light. And it's not. Right, it's, it's light. It's light. I mean, the first selection that happened in the origin of we humans was selection for dark skin because we lost our fur. Yeah. What selection force might be responsible for that? Well, uh, there are a couple of, of possibilities. If you have light skin and you're living in the tropics where our ans we know our ancestors lived and we lost our hair. So now our light skin is exposed to very high doses of ultraviolet radiation. Right. On the one hand, that means that that ultraviolet radiation can penetrate through the layers of the skin to the point to the place where it initiates the synthesis of vitamin D. At the same time, while it's doing that, so that's good. That part is good. Um, the other thing that those same uh, ultraviolet rays can do, however, is they can damage DNA, yeah. cause mutations, cause skin cancer. Another thing that they can do is they can result in the destruction of another required nutrient called folate. And mm. even they can require, they can, uh, high levels of UV radiation 
can be so high that they destroy the very vitamin D that whose synthesis they right. initiated. So the lesson here is a <laughs> wonderful one. More than one thing is happening. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, people like to think one thing doing one thing. It's more interesting <laughs> than that. Oh, it, 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 yeah. And then you have to think about in certain areas what is likely to be the biggest risk. Right. Good.